And uh, I guess we'll go ahead and turn things over to TJ Ferguson. So Archaeology Southwest invited me to come to the Ar uh, Archaeology Cafe tonight and talk about uh, the development of collaborative research with Native Americans over the last 40 years. And uh, Bill Doley specifically asked me to talk about that topic in the context of my career. And so um, I'm going to do something that I really don't like to do, which is talk about myself. And that's a testament to Bill Doley's persuasive abilities to um, lure people into this position. Um, but it's an, it's an important topic. Um, I, I don't really have a set piece. It's all extemporaneous. And so if any point you want to hear more about something or if I'm using some jargon that needs to be clarified, uh, please start asking questions because the sooner we can move my monologue into a dialogue about the topic, then the more satisfying it's going to be for everybody. And again, this is phrased in, in terms of my career, but the work I'm talking about is really not the work of a single individual. Uh, it's really been a group effort with a lot of people. Uh, Barbara Mills was involved at the uh, beginning of the work that I did at Zuni Pueblo and played an instrumental role in developing the methodologies that I'll, I'll be talking about. So I was trained here at the University of Arizona uh, in the 1970s, which was a really heady time. It was the time of new archaeology where uh, science, uh, the science of archaeology was at the forefront. Uh, behavioral archaeology was the paradigm of the day. Um, and so everyone was really focused on archaeology as a science. And I decided to leave the University of Arizona with a master's degree um, because really I felt like everything I was going to have learned, I would have learned from a book and I wanted to get some direct experience of the of anthropology I was interested in. And so when I uh, left, Gwyn Vivian, assistant director of the museum at the time, uh, pointed out to me that there was a job opening at the Pueblo of Zuni that were looking for an archaeologist to work with their program. So my last summer working on the staff of Grasshopper Pueblo, uh, during our annual field trip, which I think that year was to Chaco Canyon, I stopped at Zuni Pueblo and interviewed, and, and lo and behold, they hired me uh, to work with their archaeology program. And so that was my first experience out of graduate school, was working for an Indian tribe um, in their um, archaeology program. And at the time, it was the Zuni Cultural um, Resources Conservation Team. And they had this great plan that the conservation team uh, would uh, exist on the reservation, uh, do good work, um, and somehow everyone would fund them to do, uh, do the good work. It was uh, during the uh, time that the federal government switched from uh, the fiscal year ending in, in May to the fiscal year ending in October. Um, and so when May came around, it was pretty clear that there really was no funding stream to fund the program as we went forward. You know, I think you guys all know that cultural resources management in the Southwest is really driven project by project by project. Um, and the plan that they had set up for Zuni was really one of having this standing body uh, ready to uh, do research. And so um, at the time, uh, Bill Dodge, who was the director of the program, um, uh, his wife was a school teacher in Zuni, and so they had a family income. So Bill placed himself on furlough, and uh, Barbara and I went on half-time um, um, status, and we wrote uh, some grant proposals, including one to the National Endowment for the Humanities to do a tree ring study of the uh, Zuni farming villages. And that was funded, and that sort of got us through, and we began to build uh, the, uh, uh, a regular contract program on the part of the tribe, um, uh, much like any contract program anywhere. Um, because it was a Zuni-owned business, at the time it became the Zuni Archaeology Program, um, and because the Navajo Nation had an Indian preference a provision in their contracting, when there were too many road projects for the Navajo Nation to do, they would come to the Zuni tribe and, and ask the Zuni tribe to take on particular projects. And so we sort of cobbled together through grants and contracts an ability to run this program. And I wanted to say that, that um, Zuni conservation team and then the Zuni archaeology program and then eventually the Zuni archaeological uh, enterprise um, was really the dream of Robert E. Lewis, who was the governor of Zuni Pueblo. And uh, Robert Lewis was really interested in having an archaeology program at the Zuni tribe for a number of reasons. 
the first uh, reason was that in the 1970s, uh, when you needed archaeological clearance, as they call it, you needed real compliance with Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. And um, in the 1970s, you couldn't uh, go forward on a project until you had demonstrated compliance. Um, and what Zuni Pueblo was, f was finding and what many Indian tribes found uh, was that there was one BIA archaeologist for 22 uh, reservations in New Mexico. And so that particular individual was, was in high demand to work everywhere in New Mexico. And so uh, the one impediment to, devel to, to developing the reservation was that the BIA archaeologists couldn't come out and, and look at a particular area, do an archaeological survey or do whatever other work that needed to be done to be in compliance with Section 106. So Robert Lewis thought, well, let's start our own archaeology program, and then the BIA won't be able to say uh, we're waiting on the area archaeologists because we got our own program uh, that's got professional archaeologists and highly trained uh, tribal members to, uh, uh, to do that work. So that was one of the reasons why. Uh, a second reason was that, um, you know, one of the benefits of CRM archaeology is that it employs archaeologists. And Robert Lewis wanted to see some of that money uh, used to employ Zuni tribal members. Uh, and that's why they started this training program, this uh, two-year-long training program to train Zuni tribal members in, in um, the conduct of archaeology. Um, and ultimately, it was very successful. There was a cadre of uh, Zuni uh, tribal members who were quite proficient uh, at doing archaeology. Um, the other thing was, if if uh, some positions were going to be filled by non-Indians, uh, um, the tribe wanted to hire those non-Indians as employees so that they lived on the reservation, so that they would spend their paycheck in the local stores, and so that the economic benefit would circulate back into the Zuni economy. Um, so there's this economic rationale for why an archaeology program was uh, good at Zuni Pueblo. And then the fourth thing is uh, Robert Lewis was always interested in, in uh, Zuni history. And uh, archaeology is, of course, a historical discipline. And so he really wanted to see a vibrant tribal program doing Zuni history and Zuni archaeology as a way to preserve knowledge, traditional knowledge of Zuni things. And so all of those reasons were uh, behind forming this, this archaeological group. So I left Tucson, moved to Zuni. And my first couple of years were really pretty conventional archaeology. We would go out and do archaeological surveys. We'd occasionally go do an excavation on a Navajo road site uh, where they're constructing a road on the Navajo reservation. It's pretty uh, conventional archaeology. Uh, we did this, uh, collected tree ring samples from the Zuni farming villages as a research project. Um, but gradually, um, what the tribal council was asking Barbara and I to do uh, gradually expanded. And uh, the first way it expanded was um, when Zunis began to be concerned about sacred artifacts that they felt had been um, wrongfully removed from the reservation and put in museums. Uh, and they were interested, the tribe was interested in contacting museums, the Denver Art Museum, uh, museums in New York City, Sotheby Park Benet, where there was an auction going on. Um, and so they, uh, the tribe looked at its staff and said, well, who in our staff knows about museums? Well. Barbara and TJ, uh, they're anthropologists. They, they know about museums. Um, and so they asked us to get involved and assist the religious leaders uh, with recovering uh, Zuni war gods and recovering other types of cultural property. And so that began to get us a, a working relationship with, with the religious leadership of uh, Zuni Pueblo in addition to the civil leadership, the, the tribal council. And then uh, um, the next year, um, uh, the Zuni tribe was engaged in litigating its land rights in the U.S. Claims Court. It turned out that the Zuni um, Pueblo was one of the tribes that did not file a land claim during the Indian Claims Commission that ran from the 1950s through the 1960s um, because when the BIA official explained uh, to the tribal council what the land claims, the Indian Land Claims Commission was about, 
uh, the tribal council understood this uh, government official to say, if you want to allot your reservation, if you want to convert your reservation into privately held, individually held pieces of land, uh, you can file the Indian Claims Commission claim. And the tribe didn't want to do that, and so they didn't file a claim. Well, uh, 30 years later, Robert Lewis uh, found out from the other tribes in New Mexico uh, what was going on um, in terms of the Indian Claims Commission, and he thought that that was a great inequity. Uh, and so with their attorney, Steve Boyden, in Salt Lake City, uh, they went to Congress and convinced Congress to um, uh, allow them to file a claim in the U.S. Claims Court, which they did. So uh, I was invited to do a report on archaeology, and then since I was uh, living at Zuni Pueblo, and uh, they were deposing or taking the uh, written testimony of Zuni religious leaders about the places they use off the reservation. I was invited to um, work in the, with the attorneys and tribal members and during the deposition process. Um, and, and during those depositions, the 12 men, 12 religious leaders, developed a list of 238 uh, places, uh, mostly off the reservation, uh, where they had shrines and uh, all kinds of land use activities located, uh, grazing, farming, uh, plant collection, mineral collection, all the places that they still remembered that they had used outside of their land. Well, it came time um, after the depositions that the tribe decided, you know, it'd really be good to go visit these places. Um, <laughs> to document them in terms of where they are in, on the on modern maps. You know, clearly the religious leaders who use these places knew where they were, um, but they wanted to verify their place. And so they turned to me as an archaeologist saying, well, gosh, you, you know how to read maps and you do, <laughs> you do this stuff. And so why don't you go out there and, and uh, work with these folks? And so I had this wonderful opportunity to uh, work with people. Um, it was really funny because when I first started doing this work and I was like so eager and I had my notebook and I'd say, what's the name of that mountain? And they'd go, Maime, and I'd write down Maime Mountain. And what's the name of that place? And they'd go, Maime, <laughs> and Maime, and Maime. And then at the end of that first day, I finally said, well, what's Maime mean? And they said, I don't know, you know? And so, <laughs> so it's a lesson in, in um, an archaeologist learning how to do ethnography on the job. Um, but that really sort of transferred my focus in, in archaeology from um, the conventional archaeology uh, into applying ethnographic techniques to talk to people about the places that are important to them and why they're important and to document those places. Um, this was in the 1970s. Uh, 20 years later, that type of place gets uh, codified in the National Historic Preservation Act is a traditional cultural property. And so we have a concept that today that sort of encompasses, uh, encompasses those places. At the time, you know, we were just trying to record places that were important to people and why they were important and, and where they were and how they were used and when. So um, that really took me on this, this, this transition from archaeology um, uh, into ethnography. And I found that I really enjoyed that and, and wanted to, to continue to, to do that. So this is the very beginnings of developing a collaborative uh, methodology uh, to, to sponsor this, this, kind of, this kind of research. Well, after the land claims end, as I'm saying, they redefined uh, this, this um, concept of traditional cultural property and determined that they were eligible for the National Register if they met the criteria. And so there began to be a framework to sort of deal with the kinds of places that I've been dealing with um, earlier. And, and I continued to do that kind of work, uh, not in the, in the guise of a land claim, but in the guise of uh, projects for the uh, compliance with the NHPA, trying to identify traditional cultural places and, and why, they're, why they're important. Uh, and that, of course, involves um, ethnography. So. Um, in this work, it was really, uh, from the beginning at Zuni, it was really collaborative because we lived in the Pueblo. We worked with Zuni tribal members every day. They taught us a lot about the power of things that we didn't, don't learn in graduate school. You know, things have uh, power and, and uh, we came to respect that even if we don't understand the spiritual values that the Zunis 
uh, hold on to so dearly. We still understood uh, the importance of, of these beliefs. And they helped us uh, develop a way to do archaeology that would, that would um, benefit the community and at the same time do the least harm to the community. And so on one of the road projects uh, going west from Zuni Pueblo to a place called uh, Tecopo, for instance, we were excavating a site and there was um, human remains in the road right away uh, next to a small Pueblo. And the issue then becomes, well, what should be done? Can you just want to leave those remains there and build the road over them? And the Zuni said, well, no, that's not really respectful of the ancestors uh, who are going to have trucks be going over them every day. Um, and so then they decided, well, what needs to be done is to move those ancestors um, out of harm's way and rebury them as close as possible to uh, the original location, but outside of the direct area being impacted, which is what we did. And because we were trained as scientists, we thought, well, as we do this, we should be collecting osteological data and learning something scientifically as we go through this process. And so our original idea was to then hire an osteologist to come and do this analysis. But this is the 1970s, and you know, osteology was done in a scientific laboratory at a university. It wasn't done in the field. Um, and so we really couldn't find anyone who would come and do this. Today, uh, fortunately, this has become a standard practice where you can hire the osteologists at the Arizona State Museum and they will go out in the field and, and re recover human remains and uh, analyze them if needs be. But at the time, that wasn't the case. And so we did the analysis to the best of our abilities before those remains were reburied. But it was always a negotiation. Uh, at every point over how something was to be done and why something was going to be done and the reports that were going to be written. So it was very collaborative in, in that sense. So eventually, in, in the, um, after I left <coughs> Zuni Pueblo in, in 1981, 1982, I um, <coughs> went to return to graduate school at the University of New Mexico, where I earned a PhD in anthropology and a master's degree in regional and community planning. Um, and then I worked for um, a number of years for a nonprofit educational corporation called the Institute of the North American West. And then since then, I've had a series of small private businesses, research companies, to uh, continue to doing this kind of work. In the 1990s, um, after several years of being hounded by the Hopi tribe to come and work on their projects, uh, they eventually. Uh, offered me uh, a research position as a, a consultant for them on a project that I really just couldn't turn down because it entailed nine river trips through the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, gosh, this, what a great op research opportunity this is. And so, uh, and, and so I went to work for the Hopi tribe. And, and uh, today, I continue to work for the Hopi tribe and the Zuni tribe and, and other tribes as well. Um, and it was really at Hopi that I began to develop, uh, uh, again, working with a large group of people, we began to develop a community-based participatory research uh, methodology uh, in which we could formally involve the tribes that we were working for. They would hire us, so we were working for the tribe, and they, we would negotiate uh, who owns the intellectual property, who owns the field notes, the photographs, the reports. Um, uh, at the outset, and then once the project started, we'd go through a research design phase that was collaborative in which we would sit down with a cultural advisory group, as it's called at Hopi and at Zuni, and at other tribes with a similar body of uh, men and women, sit down and say, you know, these are the questions that the tribe needs to be answered. How can we best answer those questions? And so uh, it was very uh, back and forth in terms of developing the research uh, methodology to uh, address the, the research itself in, in terms of how to answer uh, the research questions and how the field work should be conducted. And then we would uh, go and do the field work. And then we would write the report uh, with the involvement of the tribal members that we were working with. Um, once the report was finished, we would then go back and review the results of the report with, uh, with the cultural advisory. Uh, team. And at first, uh, the first project I did at Hopi, we read the whole report, page by page, line by line. It took three or four days um, uh, to do that. 
Um, eventually, over time, as the people working on these projects became more sophisticated in terms of the style of the academic technical reports and became more familiar with the concepts that we were being um, applying in these reports, over time it became possible to sort of shorten that review session um, and tell people what was in the report. They always got a copy of the report that they could read uh, at their convenience. Uh, but during the review sessions, it became much shorter because we would highlight what was in the report, what the findings were, and most importantly, what the recommendations were uh, being made on a particular cultural resources management project. Um, so we developed this methodology that's really community-based participatory research, very collaborative from the beginning uh, to the end, uh, beyond the technical report. Uh, the Hopi tribe and other tribes have encouraged us to do academic publications because they see those publications as adding um, to the status of their program uh, to be involved in, in publishing um, and also communicating the results to a, a wide audience. And so those two things encourage them uh, to do these sort of academic publications. So we developed this methodology and then uh, around the turn of the 21st century, there's a number of academic archaeologists based in universities who really began to uh, look at this methodology and say, you know, we also want to apply that in our work. And actually before uh, academic uh, archaeologists in universities started uh, to get interested in this methodology, an academic archaeologist uh, working for what was then the Center for Desert Archaeology, now Archaeology Southwest, approached Roger Andian and I and said, um, you know, the Center for Desert Archaeology has been working in the San Pedro Valley for a decade and we know a lot about the archaeology of the valley, but we don't know much about the tribal values associated with that archaeology. And so Bill invited Roger and I to develop a, a research proposal to, um, again, I think the National Network of the Humanities, to fund uh, the Hopi tribe, the Zuni tribe, the uh, Western Apache and the Oadam people uh, to work on this project, applying this methodology that we developed in CRM, applying it now in this more academic context that's not related to a particular kind of project. But again, very collaborative project in which the tribal research participants um, have an opportunity to both structure the research questions that are being asked and how the work is being done and then how the results are being interpreted. And so that was a very successful project. And it was after that then that people like Andrew Duff at Washington State University and uh, Mike Adler at Southern Methodist University began to come and say, let's apply this methodology to other kinds of projects. And so we sort of expanded our, our range of projects that we work on um, beyond cultural resource management into other academically based research uh, research projects. Most recently, I think an example of this kind of work comes from um, research I had an opportunity to work on with the Hopi tribe that was funded by the National Science Foundation um, on collecting Hopi place names. Um, and so that particular project was really uh, creating a, a GIS uh, to manage the, G, the spatial information about place names and working with the Hopi uh, people to identify the places that they wanted to populate this GIS with and collecting that information. And of course that fits into an academic interest I have in cultural landscapes um, and how people construct cultural landscapes and use them uh, with their identity. So it all fits together really well. And I, I guess um, before I ask for questions and we can get some dialogue going here, I just want to say that with, with um, tribal collaboration, um, the only way it really works um, is when all parties get something out of it. Um, and so as a scholar, um, I have certain scholarly interests that I want to advance. And so if a tribe is willing to hire me or work with me on a project then, um, and allow me to develop my academic interests, then I get something out of it. And at the same time, if the services that I can provide provide something of benefit to the tribe, either in terms of a CRM technical report that they can use in managing their heritage or in constructing a database of uh, toponyms or place names uh, to help preserve that cultural knowledge as it, before it passes, uh, then the tribe benefits. And so really this whole work that I'm talking about is really predicated on, 
on that basis where everyone, uh, everyone benefits. So with that brief introduction, let me ask for some questions and we can continue the discussion. I guess this is a question, TJ. You, you have become, uh, I guess, universally acknowledged as the person who does work with tribal communities the best. And I'm interested to know a little bit about how you, uh, how you do that and whether you have any, uh, you know, any advice for, for others. Well, I'm not really sure how to answer that because I'm, I'm not the only person who does this kind of work. And, um, and uh, I'm fortunate to work with a number of young scholars who, um, who um, I've learned from and have helped me um, flesh out this methodology I've been talking about. Uh, the first person being Chip Colwell Chantapone, who was a fellow at the uh, Center um, for Archaeology Southwest. And Chip was great to work with. Um, and we continue to collaborate together, even though today he works for the uh, Denver Museum of uh, Nature and Science. Um, I'm currently working with Marion Hopkins, uh, and she's got a natural ability to do this this kind of work, and it's just it's really great to uh, collaborate with. So there's a whole group of people, and I'm not sure really what you meant by the second part of your question, which is how how you do this work, or. Um, well, you know, it's, it's really interesting because I, I never really <laughs> thought about it. I always wanted to do what was right on a particular project. Um, and um, it wasn't until I started working with Chip Coel Chantapone that he, he brought me to understand that what Roger Anion and I had been doing was really um, what this philosophical field of virtue ethics is all about which is you apply certain virtues. And so one of the uh, virtues is patience. And so if it takes uh, four trips to the Odom Preservation Committee uh, before they give permission, then that's what it takes. Um, and then there's all kinds of other virtues that we are practicing. And so, it, you know, it's really uh, patience and listening ability, I think, are really important. Plus an ability to um, uh, give and take. And so the first time I did a report for Hopi on the Fence Lake Mine Project, um, which uh, because we did these nine river trips uh, on the Grand Canyon Project, this other project got done before because it was a smaller project. And, and so that was the first report we reviewed line by line, page by page. And, and we started out and the Hopi advisors were saying, uh, well, we, we don't want to, we don't want to like, see in our report that you're citing anthropologists because we don't want to validate the anthropologist. And so we said, you know, it's your report. Uh, and so let's, let's uh, redact all that information. And then, and then uh, we went through bid after bid after bid of things that they didn't want to be in the report. And we were left down to where we had actually done the field work. And then they said, well, we don't want to expose people to where we went because those places are important. <laughs> And, and so we decided, um, well, we decided uh, there would be a report for the regulators, for the State Historic Preservation Officer, uh, for the Bureau of Land Management, um, and for the people who were doing the regulatory aspect of it. And so that got bound in a red cover. And, and then uh, there would be a set of public reports, and that would be bound in a blue cover. And this was a project in which it was, in, I did work with the Hopi tribe, but other parts of the project were working with Acoma, Zuni, and the Raymond Navajo. And so it was a, a large uh, body of reports that together. Um, and in the end, we ended up with the title page being released to the public. That, 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 was, that was it. Um, and, you know, it sounds kind of funny, but the, the point I'm trying to make here is, is that it's a long-term process. It's not about a particular kind of project. And my hope was, well, as we go through these projects in the future, people will come to understand more and, and want to release more information. And in point of fact, that's in, indeed what happened. And so part of it is, you know, having patience, uh, realizing that you're doing a work for hire and someone controls your work. 
um, and they own the intellectual property and and you know trying to explain to them why it's good to release this information uh, but then ultimately that's that's their choice uh, so that's basically in a nutshell the philosophy I think you had a question do you encounter any conflicts between archaeology and the people's traditional religion, particularly their origin myths? Well, as you asked that question, I sort of flashed back to when I was on the school board at Zuni Pueblo. Uh, and I was invited to run for the school board when we lived there and ended up being, although I have no children, uh, ended up being on the school board. It's a fascinating experience. And, and I remember having someone <coughs> ask not about conflict and, or, and oral traditions uh, in, in archaeology, but ask me, uh, um, where did the Zuni people come from? And, and my first response was, well, there's this cave in the Grand Canyon on the north rim of the Grand Canyon, and that's where the emergence was. And, <laughs> and the migration, I launched into the Zuni, uh, a rendition of the Zuni origin uh, tradition that the, the, the Zuni people have. And that, because I was an archaeologist, like, took this person by surprise because uh, you know, why would an archaeologist be subscribing to uh, Zuni um, origin migration traditions in relation to answering that question? But the, the fact is that that's the Zuni account. And and um, in the work that I've done, it's always been sort of couched in a multivocality in which there's not one narrative. There can be multiple narratives. Uh, so you can have a Zuni narrative of their origin and migration, or, and you can have an archaeological narrative, and both need to be presented with respect and, and uh, the fidelity to their, to their internal logic. Um, and one's not right, and one's not wrong. They, they're, they're both valid. Um, and in fact, at Zuni, um, especially uh, in the context of the school board, People said, well, that's, that's great, but you know, we all, people also, Zuni kids also need to know what the white people think, because you guys are just so interesting. Um, <laughs> and, and you got those ideas about the Bering Bridge or whatever that is up there in Alaska, and you know, and my, you know, the population of the New World, and, and we want our children to know how you think. And so they, they were really saying that you need to present both, both sources of knowledge uh, side by side, and, and that's what I was strive, strove to do in my work. And so where, where I've encountered um, contradiction, um, I've taken it not as a source of conflict, uh, because I'm not trying to say I'm right and you're wrong, um, but I've taken it as saying, uh, here, here's a really interesting situation where the traditional knowledge and the scientific knowledge um, don't fit together very well, doesn't that tell us that we need to learn more about this and we need to understand why they don't fit together well? And so I've tried to take conflict and, and transform that into a learning opportunity for everyone involved and haven't really dealt with it in terms of conflict per se in my own work. Do you see any change in attitude between the elders and the younger generation? I've seen some of that. Elder generation and younger generation of archaeologists? No. Oh, I will um, sure. Um, clearly, there's you know culture change going on all the time, and I've had the ability, the uh, pleasure at Zuni in particular, of working with uh, grandfathers of some of the men I still that I work with today. And so I worked with their grandfathers and their fathers, and today I'm working with them, and, and um, hopefully I'll work with their children uh, in, in the years to come as well. And so I've, I've seen uh, some change. It's hard for me to characterize what that change is without you know, knowing more what specifically you're interested in. Some years ago we had a meeting about, I, I, I volunteered at the State Museum in the Preservation Lab, and we were discussing, uh, we had a meeting about the return of things which have been highly polluted with arsenic and mercury and DDT and so forth. And some of the elders were very uh, adamant they should be allowed to deteriorate rather than preserve them. But I now see the younger generation is building museums on the, uh, on the reservations. 
So obviously there's been some sort of a change. Well, you know, that's the really the beautiful thing about Indian tribes is that there's not one opinion. Uh, there's multiple opinions uh, within a tribe about any particular thing that, that you might want to be interested in or be talking about. So there is this, this diversity. In my experience uh, with repatriation of artifacts from museums, um, like for at Zuni Pueblo, they were er involved in repatriation early on. The Zuni war gods become the exemplar of cultural patrimony in the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act regulations that were written. Um, and they have a tribal museum, but they never intended for the materials that they repatriate to be, uh, they want to return those to spiritual use, not to place into a tribal museum. And so there's really no conflict between having a, an eco-museum, a community-based museum at Zuni Pueblo, and uh, repatriating artifacts. Uh, it's just two different worlds that go on, and a similar situation pertains at Hopi. Uh, I'm not involved in repatriation at Hopi directly, but you know, going to the community and visiting and listening to people what to say, you get a sense of, of what's going on there. So it's a good question. Well, first of all, I want to thank TJ for um, this incredible presentation tonight. And the question, TJ, I mean, a collaborative um, research effort implies an interest, as you said, on both sides, the archaeologist and the, and the community. Can you provide some anecdotes or stories as to how some of the results of that kind of research has actually come down to affect um, community members as opposed to just the people who are directly involved in the research? You know, in, in academia we measure our research results through the publications that we write. Right? And so you guys work in an NSF project and you do publications and you have a nice uh, record, track record of, of the results of your research. And, and what I find at a place like Hopi and Zuni is the experience of people doing the field work gets shared with other people in the community in a non-written form and it's, it's really hard to measure but it has great impact. And so the people at Hopi who have an opportunity to uh, on a cultural resources management project to investigate traditional cultural places, have an opportunity to go to places that they've been excluded from because of private property or uh, federal land management policy, and they just haven't been able to go to these places uh, in recent years. So they get an opportunity to go to those places. And, and I know from talking to people that they, 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 they then go into their kiva and tell people in their kiva what they saw. And so there's like this great impact of cultural resource management and other kinds of projects uh, that's, that, that you know, diffuses in the community in that way. And so I saw this on, on the Grand Canyon project that I worked on um, in which <coughs> you, you read about the Hopi pilgrimage to the Grand Canyon uh, that was done as part of their manhood initiation ceremony. And... Um, um, there would be, as part of the formal re a religious pilgrimage, uh, when people came back to the village, there would be a big feast of the people who had been on, of the families of the men who had been on the pilgrimage. They went away as boys and they come home as men. Um, and uh, they would recount their experiences uh, that they um, had experienced on, on this pilgrimage uh, to their family members. Um, and so after several years of working on this Grand Canyon project, and it might have been after the fifth or the sixth river trip that we went through, uh, Lee Quinn-Wissioma, the director of the Cultural Preservation Office, uh, created an opportunity um, at his house on Third Mesa for all the families of the men who had been on these river trips to come and have a big feast. And lo and behold, here they are giving their accounts of where they went in the Grand Canyon, and. And uh, it was just like totally fascinating. And it, it wasn't, these aren't religious trips to the Grand Canyon, these are scientific research trips. And so the context is different, but a lot of the social interaction is, was very similar in terms of what it meant and how people wanted to share that with their, their families. Uh, so is that kind of what you're interested in? Was it difficult for you to be accepted as just outsider person versus being a visiting scientist? 
Well, at Zuni in particular, in the 1970s when we started, um, and, and once I was tasked by the tribal council to assist the religious leaders in compiling information about their sacred property that was in museums, um, and so I got invited to um, go to this late night meeting of the religious leaders in one of their, their meeting houses. Um, and, you know, this is all in Zuni. I don't speak Zuni. I don't speak any of the languages of the tribes that I work with for the reason for that. Um, and they kept, uh, you know, Zunis like to point with their lips, and so they kept pointing at me, and, and uh, I kept hearing uh, Kushi, you know, uh, re reference to Cushing who's an anthropologist who had worked at Zuni in the 1880s. And, and the, clearly the people who didn't know me um, uh, were, were trying to figure out why I was there and why I wanted to be in their meeting. And, and you know, they, they don't want another Cushing. You know, he, his time, it was there and it was over. And, and, and so there was, you know, it's a matter of trust, I guess. Um, but the religious leaders who I'd been working with specifically and who asked me to continue to work with them, um, we, we had to develop this trust and gradually other people sort of came to trust me personally. Uh, and you know, trust, you, you don't, you don't, you can't buy trust. You know, you have to establish trust through, through your actions and activities and it takes a long time. And, and I guess uh, over the years, uh, Hopi decided they wanted to hire me to work with them in part because of the trust I had established at Zuni and the things that they had heard Zuni people say about me. Um, and so then that sort of transferred to Hopi and, and so to some degree there's a transference or at least an initial establishment of trust um, uh, based on your past work that people can see. Uh, so it's uh, in essence how that works. What about incorporating any of this knowledge and information that that you've assembled into the public school system, TJ? Has that has there been any effort to do that, and how did it work out? Because it seems to me that the youngest generation of Native Americans are the ones that most need to ha be kind of consumed into this area of, of knowledge. It does need to happen, and um, but you know as a Social science scientists, basically, I provide content. Um, and what I've come to understand is that, that curriculum development is its own field, and you really just can't have untrained people uh, developing curricula when they really don't understand what they're doing. And so it's been, been hard because all the projects I work on, uh, the school teachers on the various reservations are all eager to have access to that information that they can use in school, in the schools. Um, and and uh, it's frustrating because I'm not really trained to provide that. And then beyond that, uh, is that it's also an expensive process. It takes time. And, and therefore, um, you know, you need a project that's going to fund that. You need a project to create the content, um, research project, and then, and then you need a project to create the, the curriculum. But I, but I am fortunate right now to be working on a National Science Foundation funded project uh, based out of the Turing Lab that's studying fire ecology in the Hamas Mountains, uh, studying a thousand years of wildland urban interface. Uh, with with the ancient Hamas uh, habitations, um, and on that project we hired uh, Sara Shavaria, who's a trained educator, and she's built um, as part of our project. She's doing outreach with teachers, um, and and so every summer she brings teachers from Tucson and from Hamas Pueblo um, into the field with the scientists and have the scientists uh, 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 talk to them, and they're developing curricula. And to me, that's the, really the way it should work, is, is that we should begin to build uh, educators into our scientifically funded research projects uh, to deliver those kinds of services. And it's got to start like, um, at Hamas, it started with the Hamas community saying they really wanted this kind of educational outreach. Um, and that's when they, um, the people designing this project uh, got Sada involved, and she's just doing a really great job. And so that's, we're, we're, midway through that project, it's not over, but I'm watching that project unfold, thinking this is a really good model for future 
uh, future projects because it's it's really gratifying. Uh, otherwise, all I can offer is here's my dry technical writing, uh, very academic, and uh, here you are, uh, which is not particularly satisfying. Uh, Alrighty, TJ, thank you very much. Thank you all for letting me speak to you.